I'm Sonia Morton Firth, and today you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today, my guest is John Peters, ex RAF pilot, author of two best selling books, and a BAFTA nominated documentary, Tornado Down. Shot down in the Gulf War, John was held a prisoner of war by the Iraqis. And what ensued was seven weeks of torture and interrogation, bringing him close to death. It doesn't happen that way. You're just subjected to pain. Uh, no sleep, you know, that's the other thing. No sleep, no water for days. I mean, that's one of the worst parts of violence, you know. Watch this interview to hear the story of a man close to death and how he came out stronger. I would be hoping I would chart the course of my life through because I choose to chart the course of my life, accepting that we can't control anything. I'm quite, you know, I, I'm quite happy that I'm not a controlling type character. Life happens, we respond. First of all, thank you very much for being a guest on my show. Um, we were just commenting on what a beautiful surrounding you have. Um, but I, uh, next time we will be face to face. Absolutely. Uh, I look forward to that with a glass of wine. Yes. Anyway, exactly. John, look, it's been the 30-year anniversary um, of, of your ordeal. And, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a story you have told thousands of times. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love you to share that again. But before I do, I guess I'd like to take you back a little bit further and ask you, why did you decide to join the military and become a fighter pilot? Um, I don't really know. I, I have no real military in my family, other than they did national service, uh, my parents, and no real aviation in my family. It's just I have never known not wanting to be a pilot, ever. I'm like all my mates who were pilots. They always wanted to be pilots. Go figure. Uh, I, I suppose if you say consciously, uh, I was inspired by the few, the Spitfires. I pilots of the Battle of Britain. I read uh, Douglas Bader's book, Reach for the Sky. And there's something about flying pointy jets. I get the moral component of its military, but this idea that so few people can do it. And uh, actually the freedom it seemed to provide and working at extremes that just, I just wanted to be, it's not have the job. It, you want to be a pilot. I still view myself as a pilot. How weird is that? So something about being in the sky, being a, so it was less about being in the military and fighting wars, but more about being in the sky. Is that am I paraphrasing? Yes, yes. Uh, it was very much, there was something about the RAF I, I did admire. I never really saw myself as a, a civilian uh, airline pilot. I did see myself as a military pilot. And I, I remember at 17, because back then it, uh, it you know, it was high to the Cold War and they do these tests. At 17, I had all my um, tests. Um, and uh, I remember thinking, and I was quite a green 17 year old. And I think they're gonna ask the question because the first question they're gonna ask you, and how would you answer this? Okay, Sonia, could you drop a nuclear bomb? Because <laughs> that was the first question I got. And I, I knew that um, that was the question because ultimately it, it, it's, it sounds shocking, but one, you've, you've got to, anybody in the military, you say, could you kill a, a person to military or political order? Because that's what you're signing up for. So, know, the so, they, was the so they want, not that anybody can answer that really in many respects at 17 or indeed now 59. I don't, you know, I don't know the answer to those questions really, but you've got to have thought about it. I remember sitting on a, uh, I went out to the local Heath and sat there going, could I drop a nuclear bomb? And there is no answer to that, really. And my answer was pathetic. I, I came to a conclusion, because you so want to be a military pilot or a fighter pilot, is I found myself saying, me dropping one, make it would be the end of the world scenario, and mine makes no difference, which is a moral kind of avoidance, really. But there was a truth in that. There were between 40 and 70,000 nuclear warheads in Europe at that time. So um, that was my, the way I kind of skirted around because I wanted to be a fighter pilot. At, any, at that time, did you think that you'd ever be captured and put through the ordeal that you were about, that you were going to be put? 
No, no one does. And I, I, it's not just, it's not just whether you'd go to war. I never, I, I joined the military at height of Cold War. I never expected to go to war because I thought it was the end of the world scenario. It was the mad policy, mutual assured destruction. And I didn't think the Russians nor the, or, nor the West would have uh, uh, been that stupid. Uh, to be honest, there was a balance of power. Uh, so I never expected to go to war. Um, and you certainly wouldn't get airborne up if you ever ex really expect to get shot down because you never believe it's going to be you. But that's like flying anyway. I mean, dare I say, in my time in the Air Force, between uh, a good year was only six, a bad year, maybe 12 to 15 people killed themselves flying pointy jets. So, uh, you know, flying in military flying back then had had an element of risk yeah. and you wouldn't fly if you thought it was going to be you. And all my friends who died, you know, I lost two friends in the first six months and when I came out of flying training, uh, they didn't get airborne that day thinking they could die. They got airborne just doing what they love. And that was like me and every pilot. So you, so you entered this, the, the career, this, the career, the, the RAF, um, and okay, take us back to that day where we're in 1991. Um, what, what happened? What, what was that the point that really changed your life? Uh, yes. And it's funny, you know, here I am 30 years later and it's funny how your, 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 your life is defined almost by seconds. And that's, there's a moral obscenity in that because of the media attention. So uh, in many respects, much of what's happened in my life subsequently uh, has been advantageous. And, you know, thousands of Iraqis died, uh, hundreds of our guys died. Uh, and here I am, you know, sat in a nice house because I was shot down. There's a moral obscenity there. But no, on 1991, we, it was, uh, the war started on the, the night of the 16th, where the first mission was some American F-15s taking out radars. Uh, and we were meant to come in on, the, uh, on the, the morning of the 17th of January, and we were going to plan on that day and then go the following day. But we walked in at midnight, we were midnight to midday, because you sequence the crews so you get 24 hours ops. Uh, and they said, you're going in the morning. And we went, don't be stupid, we'd agreed that no one would go in a, on a day low level sortie because it was deemed too dangerous. Um, but they said, no, no, we've decided, we've mitigated the risk. So actually don't just take that. We argued for about three hours whilst we were planning. But then I suppose if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. So we, um, we took off at 6.30 in the morning. And how many of you? Pardon? How many of there were you that took off? Uh, there was meant to be a four ship, uh, so that's four aeroplanes. Eventually, one of the aircraft went US, so we're three aircraft. We went off it, and we were part of a big coordinated attack, but we were three, and we were going to attack a airfield called Aramala Southwest, which is uh, just uh, southeast of Baghdad. Um, and we took off in the morning, um, and we were the only day low level sortie that was by done by a tornado mission because obviously we got shot down. So we took off, came off the tanker, uh, got down to low level uh, uh, in Iraq, going in uh, and suddenly at about, I don't know, 120 miles from target, you suddenly get lots of people shooting at you, you get anti-aircraft guns, they look, look like streams of ribbons in the sky, you get uh, big puffs of black smoke on left and right, and you get uh, sort of anti-aircraft bullets uh, look like ribbons, as I said, uh, plumes of missiles is going in the cockpit. So you get that for the last two, three minutes as you attack the target. Came in, our bombs didn't come off, came off the target, we dumped the bombs. And on the way home, we were about 50 feet above the ground, I suppose, doing about 600 knots. And a, a missile went right up our right-hand engine and exploded, took out our flyable wire system. Uh, put the right-hand engine on fire. Then anti-aircraft bullets came on the right-hand side and uh, hit our sidewinder missile. It ignited the rocket repellent and a four-meter torch of flame shot out the front of my wing and started to cut my right-hand wing off. So basically, I got a right-hand engine fire on fire. I couldn't see my right-hand wing because it was covered in flame. And you're trying to solve problems, get back to base, but eventually, uh, John Nickel, my navigator, starts screaming, on fire, on fire. 
And I said, I know we're on, on fire. And he said, no, look back. And I couldn't see the back of my aircraft. It was like this uh, wall of flame, um, you know, and it was coming towards us. It was like flying the nose of an aircraft outside this comet of flame. And I couldn't see my right hand. Basically, we're in this ball of orange flame, you know, 12 feet above us. Um, and so you then go enter another regime where you go, right, we can't make it back home. We have to eject. So we made a number of checks and we ejected into the desert. Um, so that was how we got shot down. And when you were, at that moment you ejected, did you know you were going to survive the, the actual fall itself? Oh, yes, you have every confidence in it. One, the ejection seat. You never question the ejection seat. Thank you, Martin Baker. You pull the handle and you expect the whole thing to work. And, you know, we ejected. We were pretty low. We ejected at 320 feet. Right. So you were... So I was only in the parachute for seconds because the parachute comes out. I mean, it's the forward speed. The parachute comes out, captures you effectively. And I was in the parachute for about 10 seconds before I hit the ground. And then you're on the ground and you don't, you expect that to work. You're on the ground. You, you suddenly effectively think, shit, because it's total quiet because you've gone from all this noise of all the battle and then suddenly to complete silence. And then you suddenly have to enter a different game because uh, you're a thousand miles from anybody who likes you in the middle of enemy territory without the power around you. So you feel extremely vulnerable. Um, so we're on the ground for about two to three hours, and then about about 20 soldiers found us. Uh, then you got this ridiculous, they, they buried us in the sand. At any point, was... did you think of running? Could, could you have left the situation, the scenario or the... Well, yes, we started to, we started to move, to move ourselves away, but, um, but you can't travel that far, you know, in two to three hours, you know, you're not going to go that far in two to three hours. Uh, and it's their desert, they know where they are, and they're in trucks. Um, and we knew we weren't going to get picked up until the end of the day, or at night, because it would be too dangerous. So we had to evade for, you know, another 12 hours. So, uh, yeah, uh, you're pretty vulnerable. Um, and so they found us within two to three hours, buried us in the sand with machine gun fire, got to us, beat us up, uh, and took us to the airfield, we just bombed there. They weren't violent, they were just other air crew and it was one of those wonder, weird things in war where they asked us questions and they said, uh, please answer our questions. We said nothing um, or else we'll have to send you to the nasty people in Iraq, in Baghdad. We said nothing and that they were good to their word. They sent you to the nasty people in Baghdad. Yeah. So what have been nasty people? And, and this started your ordeal? Yeah, well, they, they put us in a van. We're blindfolded, handcuffed. Uh, they drove 10 hours. And as we approached Baghdad, you're probably too young to remember, but if you remember the TV sh uh, show, news reels with Baghdad being bombed, we arrived at night and Baghdad was being bombed and all the anti-aircraft guns. And that's when it started getting nasty. They started smashing her face against the side of the lorry, hitting her around the head with pistol butts. They then uh, entered into the city and everyone's firing machine guns around you. You've got the anti-aircraft guns, the bombs going off. Uh, they're hitting around the head and then the van came to a halt. They pushed us out through the van. It feels like you go through this corridor of troops who are kicking, rifle butting you and thumping you. And what's, they push you in a... what's even going through? Do you remember what was going through your head at this time? I mean, do you think, did you, think you were going to die? Or... Well, yeah, you, you, you just think you're, you're going to be in pain. I mean, on the way in, on the way into Baghdad, I thought, right, I knew we were going to win the war because we saw the power around Iraq. But I thought, yeah, my life is now, I'm going to, I, I'm either going to die now or I disappear for 10 years in the Middle East. And I made a promise to myself that you can... Uh, break my arms, cut my balls off, pull my teeth out. I will not come out a damaged human being. If I survive 10 years and I get out, I will see my children grow up. I will see Helen. But I anticipate in 10 years time, Helen will be married to someone else. 
my children who my son was two years old my daughter was six weeks old when i went to war my children will call someone else daddy i won't damage their lives they have gone a different path i will see them and let them carry on the path they are but i will not be a damaged human being so that was the promise i made myself so it's funny people go on about seven weeks excuse my language fuck seven weeks to be honest uh i'd set my mind for death or 10 years 10 years how did you eat? i mean that sounded quite a logical explanation that you gave yourself and you're being battered around the head all of this is happening no not yet that was that was the driving in that was the driving in um the uh they only started battering us when we're in uh baghdad when with all the bombs and the anti-aircraft guns going in uh the battering started after that because they kicked us out through the troops who were kicking rifle, butting and thumping us. Pushed us into a room, a room about the size of this room, which is about five metres by five metres or so. And suddenly you hear this huge, and a bomb hits the building. Uh, so we get blown up. The whole building falls on top of us. We get picked up two, three metres, thrown about four metres, end up on a pile of desks, rubble and chairs. Uh, when the dust settles, they throw them in a back room. Uh, I'm trying to undo my blindfold against the wall. Uh, undo are, are, my you John, are you well? Do you know whether you're you're with John at this point? Is anyone with you? Uh, no, they've separated us already. Okay. Um, and then the door flies open. I don't know. I just don't know. A number of men come in. And my world goes black. When you say um, your world goes black, what, what do you mean? You 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 don't remember that point? Uh, no. So uh, I'm assuming just they come and beat the crap out of me. Uh, but I don't really remember that. Um, the next thing I remember is I'm in a little room. Uh, I'm blindfolded and handcuffed. And you can smell and sense the six, seven, eight men there. You can smell their sweat. You can smell smoke. You can feel the light on you, uh, bright lights shining on you. And you can smell violence, effectively. It's difficult to describe, but you can smell a sense of threat. And that's when they start the interrogation. Um, they start asking you questions. I refuse to answer the questions. And the first time I go, I cannot answer, I was going to say, I cannot answer that question, sir. The first time you go, I cannot, uh, suddenly smash your head explodes uh, and they hit you around the head with a baseball bat. And they don't ask you a question for 40, 50 minutes, five, six, seven men with baseball bats, just smash your body around your- How did you even, how did you withstand the pain? I mean, the, the, the mere thought, I mean, I, I'm not very good with well, it. Well, but you don't, but you see, but you see, uh, you don't think. Uh, and I tell you why you don't think is because you become instinctive. Um, you can't even think about anything. You can't even form the F word in head. You're overwhelmed. I mean, they smacking my back. I've got two crushed vertebrae from the ejection. Basically, I've got a broken back from the ejection as well. So they're smacking my spine with baseball bats because they know it's weak. And your whole head is lolling around as six, seven guys just kick and smash your body in the ground. I mean, you're like a rag doll. Uh, you just don't even know really what's coming. Uh, you can't form any thought in your head. It's just, uh, you can't you can't really curl up. You can't do anything. You are just, uh, your body is just, a rag on the floor, basically, as they beat it. Uh, they then uh, pull you up by the hair, ask you that question again. You say, I cannot. And then basically, effectively, for the first four or five days, which is the most intensive, it's 24 hours of uh, sensory deprivation. They beat you with baseball bats, rubber truncheons. They set your hair on fire. Uh, they burn you with cigarettes, they threaten me with gang rape, they threaten to cut my dick off, they threaten to shove knives and guns up my ass. Uh, you hear people being tortured. I've been blown up six times. Uh, you hear people uh, uh, screaming. During, during I lost two and a half stone in weight. 
during any of this point, I mean, you, you say you say it as though it's like you went down to the shops and bumped into some, but it sounds just like yeah, it, 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 yeah. you've told, I guess you've told this so many times. Yeah. At any point, did you just think, well, I'm just going to tell them whatever they need to hear? No, because you don't. You don't because one, information is power. Secondly, it, this makes me sound crass, but it's just not cricket. And I know that sounds pathetic. And it's not because I'm particularly militaristic. I don't think I may have been in the military. It's more, you just don't let yourself down and your friends down by doing that. It's just not the right thing. Even though, do. even though you're on the verge of death, presumably. I know, but you very, they can kill you at any time. And actually in many respects, death is, you don't decide to die. Death is is brought upon you. That's their decision. I mean, you know, you have lots of mock executions as well. So guns against head, triggers pulled, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so no, it, it's it's instinctive. Uh, if you if you want to get the deeper comments, uh, even if you wanted to die, you can't die. You are make yourself die. You can't say die now. Your head underwater. Oh, no, I don't know. I know girl power and all that sort of thing. I know, but you know, if we took just the uh, the, the physicality of it, and maybe yeah. what, but you go, um, you would find the strength to push some like me off. And if I was, I don't know, six foot eight, you would still have that strength to push that me off. Why? Because. It's instinctive animal instinct. You can't let yourself die. The world does not exist without us, as in that is our consciousness. You know, I am therefore I, you know. And, and, and at any point is there, um, obviously you've been trained, and presumably you are trained to some extent to, to do or to, what to say if you are caught in captivity was, what was the sort of, did the training prepare you for this? What are the sort of the... Uh, no, well, does, you know, would a, uh, does, does a GCSE in, um, <laughs> in um, uh, English help you be a journalist on the Times newspaper? Well, it gives you the structure of language. Well, that's how interrogation training is. It gives you the structure of this is what's going to happen to you. But you don't, they don't beat you up in interrogation training. And so the first baseball bat around your head or the first gun against your head where they pull a trigger, you think you're going to die. And it hurts, but you don't need to break someone's fingers to for you to know that it's going to hurt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, but weirdly, see, weirdly enough, you get used to being beaten. And after a while, quite quickly, under your hood, you're thinking, this is a shit beating. Yeah, you're not going to win. <laughs> sort of. Um, so... Because what, what? you adjust to you adjust to a different world. If I put you in the degradation and the humiliation and the pain now, it's overwhelming. But in I tell you now, in a couple of hours' time, you've adjusted to that new world. Because that's what we do as human beings. Yeah, we adjust. And it's not me. I don't have any attributes that you don't have. Everyone assumes I have these attributes. That's just somehow we have to self-justify uh, or define stuff. No, I have no more attributes than anybody. The military doesn't give you attributes. It just gives you a uniform and uh, skills to apply at war. Um, it doesn't give you character. I'm a great believer in human character. We all have it. What was the, um, what was the worst thing about that audio? The seven, because it was seven days, right? Uh, uh... Well, the first five days were the most intensive and then, uh, the worst parts were a sense of uh, faded because the bomb, our bombs didn't come off. That's probably my worst uh, sense. Uh, being put on television because uh, I thought that was the last time my children were going to see me alive. And the, the enduring image my children would have of me, their father, was that I was a weak traitor, failure of a man. Uh, and I'd they wouldn't know anything other than me being paraded on television. So it's 
it's just about holding your sense of self together and trying to choose who you are before you die. And did you decide who you were before you died? And how yeah, and that and that's that's one of the biggest positivities of the story in many respects. You know, you get so used to all this violence, and you adjust the violence and the degradation and stuff like that. But but this is where you get strength. My I suppose my philosophy now is I think we're only truly honest with ourselves a quarter of a second before we die. Because here I was, they took us into another room. This was actually after a couple of weeks later. Strip you naked, you are there a thousand miles from anywhere in a concrete room. Two men there, they get a gun out, they put the gun against your head again. And you Were you ever the... actually sexually abused or, or raped? No, are they threatened, well, they threaten me with gang rape. Uh, I, you know, uh, five, six, seven guys feeling me all over and bent over a table. But uh, at the same time, then you heard a doctor saying, don't worry, I'm a doctor, I'm checking for prisoners for sexual diseases. Uh, they didn't rape me, but I, but I do remember after that, I mean, and this this is not exaggeration, come out of that experience, and I'm doing this I, in my cell, I'm shaking like this, this is not exaggeration, and I was really angry with myself, because I went, stop, look, I know why I'm frightened, I thought they are going to rape me, so stop, I know, so stop, stop, and I couldn't stop my hand shaking for about half an hour, but in that moment, actually, that was a really pivotal moment, because I suddenly went, right, I've learnt that level of fear, so... Now I suddenly thought, you've got to be really creative. Whatever you use, you've got to push me beyond that level of fear because I've learned this level now. And therefore, from that moment on, I knew they were never going to win because you go, you learn levels of fear and you adapt to that level. And, and very much I thought uh, afterwards, I thought rape is just another form of power. You know, rape is a, 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 a crime of power, not sex, actually. Yes, yeah. And so, you know, I, I'm not gay or what have you, but you go, rape is rape. Uh, so you end up going, fine. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to let that, that doesn't do anything. It's just another form of violence. So I'm not going to internalize this and let it question me. Uh, and, then, and then you learn weird skills. So here we are, I now know, which is if you're going to get raped by a gun, which would your gun be of choice? Oh, my God. Now, don't ask that question, don't yeah. worry. You know, it's an AK-47 because the, the sights are, are on the wooden butt, not the end of the barrel. A normal gun would have sights at the end of the barrel, which means it rips you in the way in and rips you on the way out. Whereas a, an AK-47 has the, the sights on the barrel, not on the barrel. And so you actually thought about this. So, yeah, because that's the shit knowledge I have in my life. Oh, my um, so it, it it's it's just those sorts of things. I'm, that, I'm interested know. to explore the fear because you actually learned to control your fear. You said you were shaking uncontrollably, and there must have been moments where you, or you were in solid, solitary confinement. Um, well, well, you get several things, and this I, 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 here I, I, I'm jumping in, but you go. So you've got the two things. You've got first of all. Oh, I'm saying it, it's a gift in many respects. Some of it, you go first of all in captivity. Your worst threat is yourself. It's your own imagination. So if they're walking past yourself, think, oh, God, they're going to rape me. Oh, God. But actually, they're just walking past yourself. But you are spiraling away. So you have to control your own imagination uh, because sometimes that can run away. So you turn in on yourself and you identify with who you are. At other times, if the emotion gets too much internally here, you use your rational self to step out to say, well, this is not happening, this is not happening, you control it. So you have to learn how to, how, what, well, what one has to learn. What I kind of did is you learn how to flip between the two. At times, hold on to who you are, which is important because that gives you strength and not let them in through the psychological game. So you just hold on to what you believe, which is yourself. Um, and not what's happening and not defined by the surroundings to the other times when, because you're overwhelmed, your mind is running away, that you, uh, that you have to control that rationality. So there's a flipping between head and heart. And as I was saying, going back, you know, when you take you into a little room and you have the gun put against head and you hear all the mechanism going, you think, right, I'm going to die now, right. And you, I found myself thinking, I don't want to be defined 
by the circumstance. I want to die who I am. And I do believe that when they say life flashes before you, you have a million thoughts in a quarter of a second. And in that moment, you don't want to die disappointing yourself because there is no one left to impress. Um, most of us spend our lives on display. And I'm saying even with our most intimate partners, so say, and I hope I'm not trying to be overtly personal, but I have to be. Right, you're in bed with the person you love. That's the one time, you don't want any of your mates hearing what you talk about with your head on the pillow, do you? Because we all say, you know, but that's probably our most, when we most expose. But if you say, you know, was that great for you? And you think it, no, it wasn't. You don't, you lie, because we all do that. Because you, <laughs> yeah, there's no way, you, none yeah, of us would I have. I've never lied like that, George. No, of course, no, of course. No. But you go, but because none of us would have a relationship if we said what was in our head all the time. Yeah, of course, of course. Because we wouldn't. And, 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 it's it's quite, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying life. it is, yeah, no, it's been good. It's been a good human being. You know, you, you do, you adjust. But actually, when you're alone a thousand miles and they're pulling a trigger and you've got a quarter second, you go, no one is going to see me die. You're not going to see whether I cry like a baby whether I look them in the, the eye, whether I'm courageous or whether I piss myself. Mm. There's a simple fact here, I'm going to die. And therefore, you don't want to die disappointing yourself. So I kind of, I in that nanosecond, you kind of say, I want to die <laughs> being me. I understand why they're beating me because I'm a military pilot and I drop bombs. And that, I get that, but I want to die being me. And who do I want to die as? And the word... I chose was nice. 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 Uh, now, now that's see the whole way. No, no, because I wouldn't have said nice was nice is one of those words that, that is a little bit doesn't really mean a lot, does it? You say. Ah, nice you see, you're nice. repeating what my you see. You've gone through school like I have, and my, when I went through English, my English mistress said, "When you're young." Never use the, the word the adjective, nice. nice. Use yeah. a better adjective. Nice is a meaningless adjective. But, I, was, I was taught that completely. Yeah. And, but that's the word I want to die. Why? Because when I was brought up, people said my family, my mum and dad, my brothers and sister were nice people. We were a nice family. And, and however much you say, never use the word nice, that's what you say of people you like. They're a nice family. You don't say they're a wonderfully courageous family or they're erudite family. You say they're a nice family. So this idea, I disagree with this idea that nice is a meaning. It encapsulates something good, wholesome, proper and humane. And so the word I wanted to die was nice because people have said that of my, me and my family. And I wanted to die being me. And if, if nice is a meaningless adjective for you, well, I get that because you have your own choices in life and you'll choose your own word. But that was the word I want to die nice. But then therein, uh, the whole circumstance, both with how you deal with self at, during the violence and all that sort of thing, gives you an honesty and a, uh, a sense of self and identity that provides you with huge power. And at any stage, did you not want to plead with them? Or did you not? Never. Think? Never. There was no. Why would you? Well, I've never, I've never, touch wood will never be in that situation. But I, I guess, you know, uh, uh, do, do you plead for, to somebody's humanity? Please, you know, don't do this to me. You're never presented with any humanity because all you are there is they beat you, they interrogate you, and then they put you in a solitary confinement. Uh, or stress positions. Um, so there is no conversation outside of an interrogation. You don't see anybody. That's the thing. You are isolated in every sense. You're blindfolded, you're handcuffed. They use white noise. White noise is like a crackly yeah, radio. Yeah. So you can't hear anything. Uh, you can't see anything. Uh, the room is at uh, body temperature, which means you don't even flinch the microsecond before they hit you because you don't feel the fist coming towards you. So what they're trying to do is uh, exacerbate and enhance the anxiety of capture, the threat, they're playing psychological games, they don't let you sleep, so the first four days, no sleep for four days, as well as no water. So you're, 
well, no water for about two and a half days. But, uh, you know, it is really dismantling you over and above the physical. How did you and, and control, how did you even control your mind? Because that must have been one of the worst things as well while you're in this confinement, just thinking about what's coming next, what's happening next. Or, I mean, did you think about your family? Did you think about your religion, God, how you, you, know, you talked about how you wanted to die, but was there anything uh, this, uh, that helped, helped during, you? Well, there's two, yeah, there's two separate sides. You, you've got the interrogation side where within, so there's two sides of the story and there's two parts in the interrogation. In the interrogation side, you're using your brain to fight the mental battles because you're trying not to release information. Um, knowing that they have all the cards in their hands because all the psychologists and everything are, you know, trying to do all the stuff to you, play mind games. Uh, but you, in the beatings, you don't have the capacity to think of anything in reality, uh, or I didn't, because other than F you and you haven't got me yet, um, or trying to assess your where the pain is, because there's different different pains. You see, uh, a baseball bat is like crazy paving. It just shatters your whole body when they hit you with a baseball bat, whereas a rubber truncheon, you have an immediate stinging pain, and it's a really sharp, intensive pain, which is different to being uh, punched or kicked. Uh, hair is set on fire is um, scary. When they threaten to cut your dick off, that's really frightening. Uh, so you have to adjust to the different levels of pain. So you tend to be very much in the moment in the interrogation. Did you see a doctor at any point? I mean, at any point, was there any... Because <laughs> they presumably they wanted to sort of keep you alive. Yeah, uh, no, you don't see a doctor. <laughs> so, uh, no, they don't have... A, they, it's not like the British police where you can only interrogate someone for two hours and give them a cup of tea. No, sorry. I, I know I'm laughing. I'm being... I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm being unfair because it is a weird environment. Yes. Uh, no, they don't. Um, in terms or they may do, but you, you wouldn't be aware of that. You wouldn't be aware of that because you're under a, a, a hood all the time. You know. Um, so you've got that side, and then you've got the separate side, which is solitary confinement. So there's two different things in the, it's very much in the moment when you're in the interrogation and you can't really think of other stuff like that. And in the outside of that, I'm not saying this is the answer, this is my answer. If you thought of Helen, my wife and children, that's when we're soft. Those are our wonderful moments in life is that's when we're soft, we're gentle. So I view hope as keeping hope at arm's length. You can't bring that into you because it's an, a tough environment. It's a brutal environment. If you bring softness into yourself, it would make you soft. So I very much kept that at arm's length of uh, Helen, Tony and Guy, my two children. I kept them at arm's length. So it's a driver in the future that you will see them, but you don't bring them into yourself because it would make you weak. Do you get that? Yeah, so I think I don't, you, I think You're I in a brutalized violent in, environment. So uh, you you use it as a driver, but you can't afford to bring it into yourself. Yeah, because then you'd end up. I guess. It would make you soft, and you can't be yeah. soft. So how did you shut those emotions out? Basically, you you needed to control your emotions. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, much of it is about emotional control, uh, physical control as best you can. But then it's. I know it sounds sick silly but you very very quickly very quickly adapt it's just a a different world so at the moment you know you you live in a nice part of London you look very stylish and I'm sure if to motivate you maybe it would be a lovely Mercedes car maybe for sake of argument well when you're in captivity if I stripped everything away from you all your makeup and now you're just in a hessian suit and you've been you know starved for three four days and beaten and possibly raped you go a piece of potato in a small cup will motivate you more than anything you have in your life currently and you get that same level of kick you go wow 
So people go, how do you cope? Well, human dignity doesn't change. It's just that we've anaesthetized ourselves with the way we live, certainly in uh, countries like we are fortunate enough to live in, where everything's done for you. And we believe that our lives aren't whole without all the bits around us. And that's one of the things that happens in captivity. You suddenly realize uh, when they take away everything. So we're, we are overwhelmed with choice. Here, well, what I learned, and this sounds obscene really, but what I learned in captive, right, when they take away everything, I'm naked, they're using violence, even a cup of water is an external choice. The most basic human need, cup of water, is suddenly you very much realize how much choice you do have. Uh, and so, and what it taught me is life is life. And you, that is something that is precious that you hold on to. So given, let's say the absolute obscene worst horrific nightmare that I lost Helen, I lost my children, I lost this wonderful house, I lost everything that I've built, which makes you, we, we believe is our identity. Mm. So, you know, that the, the attention that say, remove everything. What the girls told me, and here I am 59, yeah? And you put me in the center of a city I don't even know in the middle of nowhere uh, with nothing. You start again, you just live, you take a step by step, and you make your choices and then providence changes. So this idea that we need all this stuff and I look, I'm immensely privileged. I'm immensely privileged. Uh, but I've always got that foundational confidence that you take everything away from me. A life, I just live a life and I will respond to it. And that gives you huge confidence. It does not look, the, the word resilience, which I think has been bandied about a lot, and everyone you do, talks about resilience, but what, what you've just described to me sounds very much like the definition of resilience of somebody that can get up, start again, whatever conditions they're in. Is, is that how you would define it as well? No, I describe it as being human because it's you and it's everyone else. I, I What I find depressing at the moment, and this may sound terrible, look, I have the tragedy for so many people who've died in COVID uh, and not being able to go to funerals and uh, yeah. death of loved ones or the simple, you know, all the things we see on media of the, the, the simple human touch and seeing the people we love. I get that. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to, do you know what's worse than captivity? I reckon homeschooling your kids in a high rise flat in London. <laughs> God, yeah. I just go hell to you, hell to you. Um, I have golf, golf smacked uh, with that. But you go, it's all you hear are the negative stories. And I'm not, I'm not unaware. The mental health aspects are way, way before COVID. It's like if you talk to a futurist 20 years ago, they were saying we've got huge mental health issues that are going to develop. And that's not because of the pandemic. It's because of the way uh, society has evolved. Human beings aren't adaptive to this. And it, the way we live today, it's, it is part of our biology not being able to cope with it. Um, but people do and will and all the conversation is about uh, the smaller percentage of people to my view who don't cope the large majority of human beings cope they adapt because human beings are wonderful and it doesn't you don't have to be go to war be a prisoner of war be on the front page of the newspaper the stories i've heard over the years of telling the story from other people where you go blows every other motivational speaker I've ever heard out the water. You go, wow, how did you get over that? How did you, that's what human beings are. We are, we are built to survive. So you, you, you I mean, I know you, you said you, you didn't suffer from PTSD after this. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I've spoken to a lot of veterans that, that have suffered PTSD, not just veterans, um, people that have been through all sorts of trauma. Yeah. Um, and what, what I, what, what I've, seeing is that it's quite linked to childhood so if you've had a distress in childhood or trauma in your childhood 
um, and and then something else happens to you in later life, whether that's you 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 know you 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 go to, into the military or the police force or whatever it is, and then something happens to you. It's the trauma linked back to the childhood that can set off as well the, the PTSD. Now, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know. It, that's just from me interviewing various different people. Um, and you mentioned you had a nice family. And uh, I mean, how was your childhood? Did you have a, a sort of a solid childhood? Well, I used to say I had a normal childhood until everyone kind of, you've heard so many stories of so many people who have bad childhoods. You go, well, maybe I wasn't a normal childhood. It was a fortunate childhood because I don't come from any money, but you go, my parents were loving. They wanted to me to and my brothers and sisters to grow, to be the best we could be. They sacrificed much of what they wanted in their lives to build our lives. So um, I would say that's a normal family background, uh, but it's not, you know, and I think one of the reasons having thought about it over the years is why uh, going through the, you know, the circumstance is much as I can look at myself and I wish I was bigger, better, stronger, more intelligent, all those things that is human nature, all of us, you know, why, you know, we look at our own bad bits and we look at other people's good yeah, bits, you know, why, why am I like, not like you? Because yeah. you seem to have everything and I'm really bad because I've got this really bad, and you go, well. Yeah, because you're so, you and that's what makes you. Yeah, we all have those. Um, yeah. um, but I don't really have any real, I don't think I have any real um, self-respect or self-esteem issues. You know, I wish I, you know, in captivity, when they're telling you all this bad stuff, you go, yeah, you're probably right. Shit, that's a bit bad, isn't it? Well, it is what it is. I say that all the It is what it is. I am who I am. And I hope I adapt and change. And I hope yeah, I don't become a boorish middle, middle-aged man, which my kids would say, well, Dad, you've missed that already. Um, but it's about just accepting uh, who you are and that you're trying your best. Um, but we will fail. And that's the thing about, you know, from captivity, I, I'm, I'm famous for failing. But actually, that's probably what Helen said, you know, said, as over the years, we've known and we, God, we met each other at 18. She says, you're really good. You met, you know, you're very good at picking yourself up and cracking on with it, basically. Do you think you'd be in a different place now, I guess, if if this had, if you hadn't have been captured, if you hadn't have gone through this ordeal, how may your life have changed? Or... Um, I think, think I hope I'd be. I hope I'd be in the same position because okay, you have circumstances, but this is now. This may be arrogance, where you go. Uh, I would be hoping I would chart the course of my life through because I choose to chart the course of my life, accepting that. We can't control anything. I'm quite, you know, I'd, I'm quite happy that I'm not a controlling type character. Life happens. We respond. Why look back? I never really look back. I, I didn't mean it. I guess not looking back, but do you think, um, look, saying the word, I don't mean benefit in, in a sort Oh, of, no, you're right. If you're saying that, no, that's the moral obscenity. Look, I, I was given I, a I, significance. I meant it, yeah, more in a, yeah. Mind, in a mindset. You grew in terms of that ordeal. And that, that sounds very flippant because you were beaten to, you know, it was a horrible situation. But if you look back, I mean, just the sort of things that you're saying here, I mean, wow, in, in, in terms of your mindset and your character and what you've gone on then and achieved, do you think that had some? If you if you look back, was that something to do with this fact that you were pushed to the edge, and you actually got to see a side of yourself that I would say pretty much ninety nine point nine nine percent of the population never get to see? Because very few of us. I mean, okay, you, there are diseases etc. out there, but in terms of being right up there with death, you know, you were faced with death right there. You were about to be shot. You were beaten to death, all of the rest of the things. And, and in those moments, you could, you could see who you really were. Oh. Right. You've, you've, there's multiple questions and yes. uh, reflections in there. Uh, I'll try and dismantle some. And the first of all, you have, uh, there's two things. We only hear about post-traumatic stress disorder syndrome uh, because that's the sexy one. If you take the percentage of population after a traumatic, extreme traumatic event, probably, and I'm not a psychologist, but it's a, it's a small percentage of population who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Very many may suffer post-traumatic stress, 
perfectly normal. About 25% of the population probably suffers post-traumatic stress. The, the rest just cope. So when I say we're built to survive, post-traumatic stress disorder is where after we've get, had post-traumatic stress, where you can't sleep, you can't, you know, you're emotionally overwhelmed, et cetera, maybe it could take days, weeks, or months to overcome, but then you, you time is a great healer. You, you then come to terms with the experience. Post-traumatic stress disorder, when I say it's the sexy one, it's the one that gives a newspaper story where someone becomes dysfunctional or it's a psychological disorder where they cannot function as a human being a number of years. Yeah, I mean, you know, normally, I don't, I don't normally, really like that word disorder because it is no, a disorder. but it is. It, 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 it's, an injury, the, it? it's an injury, yeah. right? so, so, and that doesn't have to be a police or military. It could be anybody. Hmm. There's another word which you hear really is, but it is uh, being uh, explored by psychologists, post-traumatic growth. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that, uh, I, I'm quite a believer in that. So you've got that side. In terms of would I be where I am without it? Well, I can't answer that question because I've just played the game I've been presented with. I would hope through my character, uh, I think I would have done okay. Uh, but I have to be, it would be disingenuous if I didn't say, look, because of the Gulf, uh, my life was given a significance. I was given a voice. Hell, I was given money because suddenly people wanted to hear a story. So I would be disingenuous if I didn't consider that it has been advantageous and beneficial to my journey or made my journey I would say easier had I not been shot down and that's where I'm saying at the beginning you know in, in many respects uh, I'm placed in a position where I'm a moral obscenity you know all my friends went to war well some of my friends children don't have fathers anymore because they got killed uh, a lot of uh, people in the military do suffer PTSD and they get no recognition as then, and they went way beyond what I did. And you've got all the brave men and women who've lost arms and legs. And here I am uh, with the benefit of fame, I suppose, and attention in my life broadened because of the experience. But I still fundamentally believe that had that experience not happened, I would be in a very similar place now because I do believe that is who I am. Would I have the same depth of thinking uh, arguably not, because the gift is you when you're in captivity, you're in isolation. Here, I'll give you stuff. So, uh, so I've been with Helen since 18, okay, my wife. Uh, and you're just about to die. And in between, you know, after the beatings, you go, I'm going to die here. So you try and put your life in order and you go, do I love Helen? Very easy when you're young and bonking. You know, when you used to be in the single bag and you hug each other all night, and you wake up the following day still hugging each other and all those sorts of things. Very easy to answer that question then. But what after about 10, 20, 30 years? When you're not making love all the time, you've got kids, mortgages, pensions, all the shit we all have in our life that removes that marvelous purity of young love. So you, you go, do I love Helen? Uh, that instantly, the moment that popped in my head, I went, what do I understand by love? Oh. Here you are. So you're... Oh, okay. You know, you're not... You're not <laughs> so, no, so, so what does... what Here you are, so... And it's a rhetorical question. So, so what does love mean to you? When was the last time you actually sat on your own without interruption, without a cup of tea, and I'm not talking for an hour, I'm talking for every single minute of every single hour of three days, I sat totally in pitch black thinking about love. It is a major human driver for us, and yet we spend so little time really thinking about what it means to us 
what I found out at the end, you go through all sex and love and smile and laughter and all those sorts of things. I found at the end of it, I couldn't verbalize it, but I knew I did. So that becomes affirmed. Here you are. Do you believe in God? But, but I mean, what a wonderful thing to be thinking about while you're in this situation, you know, love is... Well, that's what I mean. It, it's a, in some ways... It's a, what it all comes yeah. down to in the end of the day. And they do say a lot of people that are at that deathbed moment, that's what they think about. It's, it's love. It's not the millions that you've made or yeah. materialistic stuff or even how good your work career is. All oh, that's a load of bollocks. What you're thinking about is love. Yeah, love. Yeah. Or you get, people, do you believe in God? Now, we all go whether you do or not. I would say I was agnostic. Uh, but in captivity, I, I found myself doing this. And I go, what am I doing? Am I, act am I just doing this because of Pavlov's dog? Because when I was young, uh, you know, at school, they did all the taught Christians it all good news Bibles when I was young and I did Cubs and Scouts and they did the Bible and you get taught the Bible and all this sort of thing so, so am I doing this because of Pavlov's dog because you get told from the year dot God exists or is it just a psychological construct in the fact that I'm that frightened now uh, that I can't deal with it myself so we construct this thing called a God that we can offload but it is a psychological construct or am I praying to a deity so but is there, you have, a, there. Did you have an image in your mind when you were going through? no but you can't help the image of a, 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 a and this is so you know this when you say i'm conscious bias you know the white haired gray you know big long beard well, yeah. um in the image of us um so i spent days thinking do i believe in god so uh, and it took me about seven eight years after the gulf to come to terms with what i think i believe to to try and dismantle some of those thoughts and it's interesting for all the stuff I can talk about rape and violence and stuff like that the thing gets most people emotive and this is in our, our secular society is when you talk about God Would you say we're not in America we're not in America here but even in Britain you start talking about God and which God you believe in and I, I, I tell you it gets people um, so this idea that we don't believe this underlying narrative that is percolated throughout our society. And I've deliberately used neutral words there to say that because for people who don't believe, it, it, it's the assumption in all our language because all our institutions are defined through a Christian philosophy. Yeah, way we do law, we wait, uh, just everything. So it's, it's really interesting when you have no society, no restrictions, other than your sense of self. That is your escape in, in captivity. You explore identity and it becomes uh, definitive in that manner. Yes. Am I just being a really boring pontificating old git here for God's No, sake. not at all. I was going to say, is it religion or is it spirituality? Was it the moment well, that you were praying because you were so close to death that you know, I, I'm assuming because I've never been again in that situation, but that I want, would want to reach out to whatever I believed in. And, um, you know, I, I would say I'm spiritual rather than religious. I do believe in something. I, I don't believe in the big guy with the white beard. Uh, I wish he, wish he did come for the Christmas and all that. But I do believe there is something. Here we are. Why? And this, when you say I do believe in something, but not, but you go, how much real thought have you put into that without interrupt to actually go so what does sonia think really not just think feel or identify with so a fundamental because it's really difficult you know belief is just a, a concophony of all our assumptions we make of what make what we believe and can we separate that assumption from the fact that we're both white uh we can we're british i'm assuming so we come from this part of the world with privilege and, and how do we separate? I'm from Newcastle, what? so I don't know where, British. Yeah, I know, really? Newcastle, well, is that now? I know, you're not real British, are you? Georgia, for God's sake, because you're fine. No, but you, but you know what I mean? I know now I'm sounding rather pontificating and pompous here, but you say we get immersed in the way the world tells us to be, and then you end up where there are no rules, where you go, who am I? Uh, and so it becomes a real definitive 
sense of real identity because you don't have to conform to anything because you're going to die. John, so I say that's there a, is I no radical, you know, I, I you've got say that's such a spiritual thing. Who am I? Because you're not your body. Your body had just been beaten to up to a pulp and you were seeing yourself outside your body. You are not your body. You are not your mind. You're outside. You, I mean, obviously you, you can feel no. pain, but you're not your body. No, and I mean, there's the, the cliche, isn't it? There are no there are no atheists on the battlefield, and there's a truth there. But as you say, this idea of defining between spirituality and true religion. I mean, I here's the most uh, arguably offensive uh, thing I've I've sometimes offered. If you're a true believer, and it doesn't matter what religion you are, let's take it Christian. But if you're, it's very easy to say Muslim or Islamic or Christian. Let's take the Christian because it's the safest because. That's what I suppose you define myself as in, in, in some regards. I've been brought up in a Christian state. Uh, you shouldn't be scared of death. Why are you scared of death? Because actually, if you take a Christian view and you are a true believer, God puts us on the world for three score years and 10, so 70 years, uh, and gives us free will to explore, but then will give us infinite heaven which is nirvana so you should want death because if you if you're a true believer <laughs> and god can see into your heart god can see in heart because god we have a forgiving god so whatever you do he will forgive you because he can see into your heart and if you are a true believer he forgives and therefore he will give you everlasting uh, nirvana which we call heaven so actually you should not be scared of death because actually if you take the thing life is a bit shit what God will, is offering you is eternal life. So you should not be scared of death. So from my, my uh, thinking, I think we are scared of pain, humiliation, and loss. So pain, none of us want to die painfully. Mm. You don't want to go from, and I'll be deliberately uh, schmoozy here, but you don't want to go from your beautiful self. You don't want to think of yourself as old, ugly, with pusses all over your body, where everything is, you know, you don't want that. You don't want to let people see. So humiliation and all this. Also, you've got pain, humiliation and loss is the fact that we yearn to see our children grow up or our grandchildren or the fact that we won't see. So I think those are the three fears when when is pain, humiliation and loss. It's not it. Uh, the idea of actually trying to uh, and our instinctive animalistic, we can't make ourselves die um, that. And it depends on your narrative as to which God you believe in, as to whether you truly believe that you will be going to that place. And if you're an atheist, well, why be scared of death? Because there's nothing. And therefore, again, it's this idea of loss of life, but the actual uh, afterwards, why be scared? Because you're not conscious of it. You just go to dust. Therefore, there is no reason to be scared of death. So I found myself, think yourself dead. Well, you can't think yourself dead because the moment you start thinking about yourself dead, you must be alive because I think therefore I am. Therefore, it is pointless worrying about death. So that is how boring you get in captivity because do remember, I spent 24 seven to seven weeks on my own. So these are the circular arguments that you're trying to just play. Well, it, it's two of the biggest things, you know, you've discussed, you've thought about love, and what happens next? What happens after after death? Is there a, is there an after death? Um, and those are the two things I guess most people would think of. And yet, money didn't come up to it, or any oh, did I lead a good life? This that oh, you know, what's my work life or anything like that? My material possessions mm -hmm. that didn't come into it. John, I could talk, I could absolutely talk talk to you forever. We could go on. This has been fascinating. I've been really boring, haven't I? Sorry. No, no, it's been absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, is there any look? There, there are people that are going through times. We have mentioned COVID. Um, are there any? And you've been through the most challenging time. Is there any bits of advice that you would give people now that are feeling to have felt that challenge? I think advice is the only vice we don't want, isn't it? Um, however, uh, I suppose from my experience is to say, 
it's never over till it's over. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you talked to me 30 years ago, uh, I would have told you it's impossible. Whereas here I am 30 years later. So whatever we believe is impossible. And I suppose my caveat to that is there is always a better answer. There's always another answer. We can tend to get really myopic on things. You know, uh, during the pandemic, everyone's been just a bit myopic. Whereas you say, I think it, the number of opportunities and uh, changes has accelerated that I think despite the tragedy, tragedy and with respect to the huge personal cost of COVID, I think that there are, are stunning things that will be born from it. Even down to the fact that the conversation changed from the divisive Brexit conversation in Britain. Oh God. To no, a completely- on that topic. <laughs> no, 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 but actually listen, it was almost how, when you say people aren't adaptive, yes they are. Because even within families you had that, and really good oh, friends, right. blazing argument with friends on Brexit. It uh, doesn't mean I don't love them. It just means we have a fundamentally different view. Yeah, I had moment... I had friends that didn't talk to me because of Brexit, and and, and, yeah. and you know, and I was at, at the time I was I was actually working in the city. I had colleagues not talk to me about yeah. that. You know, it was it was just awful. There was it was a fractioned. We, we and, and this actually funnily enough the same with COVID as well. It, you know, vaccine, no vaccine, go outdoors, don't go outdoors. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of fractures. Ah, but you can see you're off your city go, you see, because no one likes each other in this city. Whereas <laughs> I, I live in the country and you go, no, no, you go, you go. Whereas the moment I see my I have an opposite view of COVID, because the moment COVID had, look at all the memes and everything that's gone on mobile phones. You just, the humour instantly was just wonderful. Then you get the compassion and the warmth that suddenly the whole conversation in, in terms of community, sit, checking up old people that you never even knew half the oh, time existed absolutely. down the road. Uh, Zoom, you know, oh, everyone goes zombies. Yes, well, I used to phone my mum every so often. Now we almost have a weekly Zoom, for God's sake. And and including my brother and my sister. My brother lives in the States. We never, you know, we talked about three, four times a year now. We probably have once a month, you know, we have a family Zoom. So there's a whole bunch of real positives. Um, how are we going to change the ways of work, which, to be honest, have been outdated for decades and now it's given a whole load of people voices for young families the three you know all the hybrid way of working you go why am I spending you know running around in the morning trying to get the kids sorted because I have to commute to work so one oh the stress where you go I'll sort the kids and then I'll come home start work because I'm not commuting I mean there's a whole bunch of huge positives that just wouldn't have arrived had not it be happened so I view it very similar to my experience these things from bad circumstances, we get creative and we grow. I absolutely totally agree. I think I think everyone's grown in one way or the other through this. They might not see it right now, but it's it's changed everyone. It's changed all of our lives in, in one respect or another, absolutely. Um, uh, John, I'm, I've got to come to my final question, which I ask all my guests. And I feel like I, I could we could talk forever. But my final question is, if you were to write a message in a bottle for future generations to find, what would the message be? I think there's that. There's always another answer. There's always a better answer. You know, there's not one answer. There's not one track. There's several tracks. And, and that is the joy of life, is you deal with it and make another decision. So there's always another answer. John, that's been amazing. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox.